The psychedelic revolution is here. If you want to integrate your visionary experiences into your purpose, get clear on your entrepreneurial path and help people while you do what you love, then this podcast is for you. Welcome to The Psychedelic Entrepreneur, medicine for these times. I'm your host, Beth Weinstein. I'm a spiritual business coach, three-time entrepreneur, and a lifelong student of psychedelics and sacred plant medicines. You carry your own unique medicine, and your medicine is what we need for these times. This podcast will help you to share your medicine so you can create transformation in the world. Listen in on conversations with psychedelic leaders, change makers, and conscious entrepreneurs who are living proof that a better world is possible when you follow your heart and live in alignment with your soul. Hey everyone, welcome back. Today I'm so excited to have Stephen Jaggers with us to talk about breath work and somatic release and lots of good stuff. Stephen, thank you so much for being with us today. It's good to have you here. It's absolutely an honor, Beth. Thank you so much. I am so excited because I met you um, for a brief moment and was introduced to your work through the Fit for Service community, which is the Aubrey Marcus community at um, a, a summit, as they call them, in Sedona. And I personally was going through a, a huge breathwork experience that um, blew my mind. And you were one of the people helping hold the space for people like me who were kind of going into a really deep psychedelic <laughs> state. So, um, but let's get into it. I'll, I'll tell people a little bit more about you and then we'll get into the questions. So Stephen is the founder of Somatic Breathwork, a revolutionary new breathwork modality that helps people get out of their thinking mind and into their bodies. He has a background in teaching kinesiology, energetic anatomy, and is a neuromuscular therapist. His love for human optimization and structural, structural intuitive movement is his passion. He hosts the Mind Body Mentor podcast, which interviews some of the top experts in health and wellness today. When he's not working, you can find him playing music, learning new instruments, and grounding himself outside in nature. And we have links to his websites and his work right here in the show notes. Stephen, I always love to hear your story of how you got to where you're at today. Um, how did you come to find breath work, make it your business? You know, what path were you on uh, before this as well? Yeah, it's, um, that is a, uh, a massive question <laughs> and I will, I will give you kind of the short, long answer, I guess, the duality of that. <laughs> um, so I was born an only child. Um, my parents were both, um, drug addicts. They suffered with a lot of addiction issues, uh, when I was young while they had me. Um, and I was always such a sensitive child. I think I was always very aware. And I mean, most children are very aware. And when you're, when you're that young, you're, you're picking up on everything. And especially being an only child, when I was about five, they had moved to Arizona uh, to um, go to a, uh, a rehab center. And we ended up starting a new life in Arizona. And I didn't really know what was going on, but I, but I knew what was going on at the same time. And through that, I kind of like growing up, I really watched them really struggle, really uh, just suffer from like anxiety, depression, and I watched them kind of switch from prescri or from these hard street drugs to uh, I, I didn't necessarily watch them, but I know now that they kind of switch from these hard street medic uh, drugs to prescription medications, and I kind of watched them cycle through different prescription medications and continue to kind of really suffer and struggle with anxiety and depression. And even through school, I, I always wondered why they couldn't, you know, come out to sports games or meet other families or do kind of the normal stuff that other families were doing. And through that process, I, I became quite a, an individual too. I think that I, and, and there was blessings in that because they really didn't force a lot of things on me. They really kind of just, 
you know, they gave me so much unconditional love and they were really just struggling in themselves. And they, you know, they told me like, just, I don't care what you do, but just don't do what we did. (laughs) So it was really, um, you know, they were sort of those transitional characters that I think decided to not pass down the, the sort of generational trauma, if you will. They really, um, did an incredible job at that. And I, I'm so thankful for them, but I watched them struggle and it really, I think a lot of the drive, probably the unconscious drive for me is to want to help my parents and to want to help others. So they don't have to go through similar things, but fast forward through that. I was always a very physically active person, played lots of sports. I was an amateur skateboarder, uh, skateboarded in lots of competitions. I played basketball in college and, um, I was always so, uh, physically active. I was always out in the streets running around, um, you know, playing outside. And I came to the realization that, uh, I, you know, when you're that physically active, when you're doing things all the time that are getting you in your body, you're not thinking about what's going on at home. You're not thinking about the future, the past, you're kind of just in the present moment. And so I quickly became very fascinated with, uh, the body And I also was very fascinated with the mind. I wanted to know like, what was the thing that was causing them, you know, so much strife, so much struggle. And so outside of uh, high school, I went to, I couldn't decide what I wanted to go to school for. I went down the physical therapy route. I was so fascinated with the body. I also went down um, and I studied addiction psychology. And so I couldn't decide. And unfortunately, our world is not set up in a way where we combine, you know, mind and body um, necessarily in traditional school. But I went down this body route. I went down this mind route and I ended up dropping out of both (laughs) because I was not so good at just reading books and um, throwing up information for a test And I ended up dropping out and I had a little uh, chapter of working a corporate job uh, as a human resources executive for a microchip company, um, which is completely different. I wore a suit and a tie for two years. I was like, I was like 19 and um, I'm really glad I did that because I figured out that that was not for me. Um, But during that time, I, and we can get into this, I started exploring with different psychedelics. I also started, um, I had been sort of a heavy cannabis user when I was younger, probably 16, and I ended up stopping. And I ended up having lots of uh, lucid dreams, if you will. Um, You know, when you stop cannabis, you have sort of a REM reuptake where you start having wild dreams. And I wanted to understand this phenomenon a little deeper. And that kind of sent me down a rabbit hole of studying like altered states of consciousness and you know, learning about your energy body. And it was all so new to me. And it kind of was the thing that led me down a rabbit hole. And I was very fascinated on this kind of new understanding of not necessarily new, um, but new for me understanding of mind body connection and, and health and wellness from a different perspective. And I ended up finding, um, a holistic school And through a friend who I had been receiving body work from, um, I actually was sort of diagnosed with uh, some scoliosis or some spinal uh, fusion in my thoracic spine, kind of my solar plexus area, which for those of you that that don't know, that's kind of your fire center. And my parents were addicted to meth, which is um, a lot of the times when people have issues with their fire center, it is uh, an addiction to stimulants. Um, so that probably was passed down to me. Um, I, I think, uh, so I was having some issues with my own body and I found a lot of, um, relief through body work and more than anything else I had done. So I was like, well, I can, I I love to like, you know, I'm, I'm a very touch centered person. That was one thing that my parents really gave me was a lot of touch. Um, that was definitely a love language, uh, per se, but I became a, a body worker and, I, at this school that I went to, they taught so many different modalities. It was like a Hogwarts school for, uh, the modern, modern times. Um, I studied lots of different forms of, uh, Western body work. Uh, I'm a neuromuscular therapist, which is very focused on, um, 
postural balancing and, uh, and really looking at the body, um, from a musculoskeletal perspective. I also studied lots of different Eastern modalities such as, uh, polarity therapy, cranial sacral therapy, um, some Reiki and, and, and looking at the sort of energetic anatomy. And I became, I ended up loving it so much. I became an instructor there. As soon as I kind of got my hands on someone's body, it made everything so applicable for me. It made the books that much easier to read um, because it was a direct application. And I think most of us are probably experiential learners um, more than we are sort of auditory or visual. Um, I'm a very kinesthetic person. And so I ended up teaching there for a long time. Um, I taught a lot of the Western understandings of body work and I taught some of the Eastern uh, uh, energetic classes as well. And through that, um, I, I helped run an injury rehab center. I also ran my own practice, uh, working with lots of clients. And in 2017, I, um, was really, uh, I was going through this sort of psychedelic phase for myself and I was really fascinated on utilizing psychedelics, uh, with in conjunction to psychotherapy and body work and, you know, I came across this organization called MAPS, which I'm sure a lot of people are familiar on here. I ended up volunteering uh, in 2017 uh, to at the uh, Psychedelic Science Conference um, in Oakland, California. And I kind of helped run the uh, sort of healing area body work there. And I th had thought that I wanted to go back to school to become um, this new uh, uh, career path, a psychedelic psychotherapist. And I had some friends that were like, have you ever done breath work? And I'm like, yeah, I've done Kundalini yoga. I've done some Wim Hof, you know, it's, it's, it's good stuff, you know? And um, they were like, well, there's this guy named Stan Groff. He's holding a session. And um, I was like, cool. Um, they're like, it's very powerful. And I was like, well, you think it's power more powerful than DMT? I don't, I don't think so. <laughs> um, and I ended up going to this session and I had such a profound release, um, on a somatic level more than any of the body work, more than any of the acupuncture, more than any other modality that I had ever utilized. And it was a very similar experience that I, that I had from psychedelics um, but the integration was very quick and it was very clear. And what happened first is that I started to become very aware of this sort of blockage in my spine. And I started as through the breath work, I started to be able to kind of get into some of those areas. And I had um, developed quite a, a kinesthetic awareness just from the amount of body work and training that I had done. And I started to like really release emotion, tears, crying, yelling, sort of the full spectrum of emotions that were running through me. And I had this sort of somatic release that happened, this clearing on a somatic level, this emotional discharge. And after that, I became so clear mentally. I, and I had this clear vision that I had always been a breath worker. I'd always been a breath worker first and I, a body worker second. And it's fascinating because I tell this to everyone. If, if you are someone that's working with other people in any sort of capacity, you are a breath worker because your breath is the number one thing that controls your nervous system, your nervous system. You could call it your chakra system. You could call it the, the electrical system of your body. If you are working with someone in any sort of capacity, you are either consciously or unconsciously um, attuning yourself to their breath. When I was working on people's physical bodies, um, if someone was holding their breath, whatever I'm doing with them, it's not really landing because they're in a defensive state. And so I wanted to, to study lots of different types of breath work. And I started combining it with um, some of the body work practices and I just saw such deeper lasting effects, such um, uh, uh, nervous system reset and um, a, re a real like digestion of people's uh, emotions. Um, and my work was just, um, it was taken to another level. And so I started doing lots and lots of sessions, um, combining a lot of the different modalities that I had studied. 
And uh, yeah, that's kind of where we're at right now. Amazing. Thank you so much for sharing that story. I love it. It's um, I can actually relate to a lot of it because I very much like you, I, I actually grew up on the West Coast playing sports and um, was an athlete my whole life and then took up marathons and ultra running. And when you're so in tune with your body, you start to connect the dots. It's like, well, I had done psychedelics and I had done sports and experienced the same feelings. And I started to, and then I studied psychology and the brain and neuroscience in college. And I just started to put two and two together. Like, why is it I feel the same way running a marathon as I do on MDMA, you know, and, and really going inward into, to wondering like there, there has to be another way. Or why is it that when I'm trail running and I have just pure presence, everything's at ease and I'm not in fear and I'm not worrying about anything and everything just seems to flow. So I love, I love all these connections and this path to bringing you to what you're doing now. So let's talk about the somatic breath work that you teach. I know you do a lot of trainings. I've had friends do your trainings. Um, you know, I've been hearing about your work and witness some of it. And, and also, you know, what makes your breath work modality different than, you know, like the Wim Hof or, um, you know, the other kinds of breath work that's out there. There's, you know, a million different kinds. There's it seems so many different days. types. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, that's, that's a hard question and I'll try to, uh, uh, give you as much as possible, but this modality is, it's not a self practice, meaning that it's not a practice that you do by yourself. And it really, um, it really, uh, helped me kind of coin the term somatic relating, so it's actually done with at least two people and it's done like with a client and a practitioner. So it's not necessarily a self-practice, but it's something that you do with another person or in groups. And it's a combination of body work, breath work, and also guided kind of NLP cueing. So NLP is um, neuro-linguistic programming. It's, uh, it's a way to tailor your language to kind of speak to someone's subconscious mind and body, really. Um, so it's a, it's a combination of those three, and it's also a combination of different types of breath work. So a lot of people don't really understand that breathing heavily for an extended period of time, a lot of people will say it's hyper oxygenating the system. It's actually not, um, you are sort of depleting yourself of oxygen when you're breathing that much. Um, which I can get into like some of the physiology that's going on. Um, but I think that this part will land for a lot of people is that if I was being chased by a tiger, like how would I be breathing? I'd be breathing like, <sighs> and so <clears throat> what's going on is that when you are doing that type of breath work, you're actually sending your physiology into a state of trauma, into a stressful state. It's actually very stressful for your system. And it's not something that you need to do all the time. It's just like psychedelics. It's not something that you need to do all the time. It's very intense. And so um, you have to be very careful and you, you have to be sort of trauma informed, if you will, because you are in a safe container taking someone's physiology into a state of stress, into a state of trauma. But what happens is when someone is in that sort of container uh, and they feel safe, and they have, you know, sort of an empathetic witness that is holding space, which I would love to define that term um, for people. What happens is that you create that sort of elevated state, that state of stress, that state of trauma. A lot of the times it will bring up a lot of the undigested, unprocessed um, somatic uh, uh, defense systems that people have not have, had a chance to release um, because it's very hard to work with people's defense systems. It's really hard to work with people's um, patterns in their normal everyday waking state. You kind of have to take someone into an altered state. And so you, we can sort of mimic um, that sort of trauma state through this breath work and it creates an opportunity for this organism to discharge, to complete sort of the necessary action that they needed to do in the present moment of that sort of trauma or that stressor. A lot of people in our culture and our society is set up in a way um, where people suppress 
um, where we want to hold it all together for our friends, our family. We want to, you know, um, uh, we don't want to show weakness. We don't want to show vulnerability. We don't want to show sensitivity. And even that word sensitivity, I think, has a lot of barnacles on it that that scream weakness when uh, to become sensitive is actually to become more alive. It's actually to become full of sensory awareness. And, um, you know, Peter Levine says it so well that, you know, although humans rarely die from trauma, um, if it's not resolved, it can severely diminish our life. And, and a lot of people call this a living death where so many people are, they're alive, they're walking around, but they're not really alive. They're living in this very small window of existence where they they don't have access to some of the lows, you know, they're numbing themselves. Um, and they also don't have access to some of the highs of life. So with this type of breath work, and it's, it's kind of a two part thing. Um, we take someone's nervous system into that elevated state, into that stressful state and give this organism an opportunity to discharge, to, um, to release emotion, uh, to have a somatic release. And then once that person kind of has had a somatic release, um, we want to show the nervous system how to regulate itself after that. So a lot of breath works, um, specifically holotropic and a lot of these other um, longer breath work journey style modalities, they're all around sort of clearing and releasing. And I actually changed the name of our modality from somatic release breath work to somatic breath work because you're not just releasing. Um, during the first half, you're releasing. But during the second half, um, we want to show and we want to fire and wire new patterns on when you're in that stressful state, when you are releasing, how to actually bring that nervous system back into a state of regulation. And so we switch from that intense breathing to elongated exhales um, in and out of the nose. And, and this kind of gets into a little bit more of the esoteric aspect of it or the, um, and it's, it's, it's highly based off of Joe Dispenza's work, but once someone clears on a somatic level, they become clear mentally. A lot of people want to work with people's, uh, limited thoughts or limited mindsets and people don't choose to have limited thoughts. People don't choose to think limitedly. A lot of the times those limited thoughts are a byproduct of what happened on an emotional level and an instinctual level. Your body is an antenna if you, and, and, and we're animals. We've forgotten that we're animals. And if you are stuck in a contracted state physically, you're going to be picking up on contracted ideas. Mm -hmm. And so that second half, once someone has kind of moved out of that, that contracted state, that wounded animal state, they have the opportunity to create an elevated state to create an elevated emotion and fire and wire that elevated emotion back in. So we take someone through this arc where we give them an, the opportunity to release. And then once they've clear, a lot of the times people have clarity, they have uh, visions, they have, and like I said, I had a vision. And so we want to anchor that vision back down on a body level and create an elevated emotion around that and relax the nervous system back into that. So we train the nervous system how to come back, but also when people like move out of that wounded state, a lot of the times they feel safe enough to access those elevated emotions. And this is something that people, uh, a lot of the studies around psychedelics um, have shown is that once you've sort of expanded um, to a certain level of consciousness or once you've kind of uh, accessed a certain state, um, your system knows that that state's accessible later on down the line. And so we create that elevated emotion and the body, mind-body system knows that that state's accessible later on. And so there's a very clear integration process with that. And it's almost instantaneous. Beautiful. No, I, I love this because I, you know, I personally have found some breathwork experiences to be you know, so powerful that it, it rivaled a lot of psychedelic experiences. I'm one of those people. I always get visions. I always have um, releasing of God knows what come through, uh, you know, just old trauma patterns that are held in my body, maybe in the collective. Who knows? Sometimes I feel like, 
you know, something will just come out and I don't even know what the story is behind it. It's just something so deep in my cells. But then, you know, if if it's like, oh, okay, let's wrap up and move on. It's like, well, then what? You know, this actually happened to me about a year ago where I was in a breath work and there wasn't really an integration built in. And I was one of those people that was still kind of processing it as we moved on to the next thing at the retreat. You know, it was like, wow, that's yeah. that's a lot. And, you know, you don't want to re-traumatize anyone either. This is kind of a similar yeah. discussion that comes up in psychedelic states as well about this idea of integrating of, you know, you mentioned a lot of the patterning, you know, the whole getting to the root and the core of what's causing the, you know, the problems or the issues or the limiting beliefs in the first place. It's like it's deep within your energetic patterning and your your wounding and your trauma response patterns. And if we don't actually have a container built that is able to hold that, including psychedelic states, it's like, well, then there's not really the true healing that people are seeking. Um, but let's talk about that a little bit. I'm curious, you know, what I've noticed over the years, and maybe it's just because I work in this kind of in this field, is that a lot of people who are drawn towards um, psychedelics and plant medicines have also been drawn towards breath work. Um, do you find that a lot of people who attend your trainings are working in both realms? Like, do you get a lot of psychedelic yeah. facilitators? And and let's talk about that because, you know, a lot of us are out there saying, well, we don't even need the psychedelics because you can access the same state and maybe, like you said, with an easier integration. But yeah, let's let's hear a little bit more about that. These two worlds yeah. colliding. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. We have so many people that come to take these trainings that want to utilize this modality in their in their practice, in their um, in their business, uh, or just with their friends and their their family and their community. And I love psychedelics. They have been such a a, a powerful um, tool for myself. And uh, but I think that a lot of people come in and they want to combine these modalities. They want to combine this sort of breath work modality with different psychedelics. And I think that, uh, as humans, we always want to just like, we, we always want to make things like intense as possible. We want to just throw the kitchen sink at people where, and we live in this world of sort of instant gratification where we want this change and we want it now. But you look at nature and nature changes slowly. Slow, gradual change is healthy. Anytime, like I, you look at these plants in the background, like they change slowly. Your body changes slowly. Like your mind can change like that. You can change your mind like that, but your body changes slowly. And so slow, gradual change is healthy. Uh, if you look at nature, like usually when something changes quickly, um, it is quite traumatic, like a volcano. Or like if I were to change my physiology quickly, I probably broke something or I probably tore something. Mm -hmm. And so we have to kind of switch from this understanding of this in this um, instant gratification and like instant change and transformation to a slow, gradual change. Like less is more. A little bit at a time is okay. And I think so many I work with so many people that put so much pressure on themselves to um you know, have this massive transformation right away where they don't actually give themselves credit for like what, like the, the, the small percentage of change over time. And that's actually much more, um, it's, it's, it's much more sustainable, sustainable change, you know, happens from the inside out. And a lot of the times people want to have this massive change, um, but then they actually haven't developed the skills to actually hold that in their body. Like mm -hmm. you can't skip steps. A lot of the times psychedelics can allow you to skip quite a few steps. Um, but if people ha don't have the certain practices in place to be able to hold um, that growth, that change, um, a lot of the times it's kind of just, you're just like playing around. And I, I can say that for myself, like, um, I've experienced quite a rapid growth, uh, in the past year and it's been a little dysregulating. It's been like a little, um, intense for my system and it's taken a toll on a lot of the relationships around me. Um, but you know, the short definition of trauma is too much, too fast. And 
that's another thing that I, I uh, part of my uh, mission is to like change the outlook on trauma because trauma actually creates growth. Trauma is guaranteed in our life. Stress, trauma, death, taxes, all those things are guaranteed in our life. And those are actually the stimulus that create growth, that create new adaptive patterns as a species, um, as a collective. Um, I think that as a collective, we're, um, we're, experience, we're experiencing a lot of collective trauma. And one of my good friends states that trauma is a question to the organism. And the question answered is finding a new adaptive pattern is growth. The question unanswered creates symptoms. And those symptoms are a lot of the times pain. And that pain will continue to uh, um, sort of manifest in lots of different ways until the organism finds a new adaptive pattern. And so as a, as a collective, we're kind of having a question asked to us, like, what's the new adaptive pattern? And we'll continue to experience symptoms of pain until we find a new way, a new, a new adaptive pattern. And maybe those symptoms are, you know, school shootings where it's like humans that are just so suppressed and they don't have a place to actually express themselves in a healthy way and they end up lashing out on people around them. And so it's a, it's a bigger, it's a bigger thing. But the thing about breath work versus psychedelics is that anytime you ingest anything, that thing has an agenda within your system, whether it's coffee, whether it's uh, food, whether it's ayahuasca. Ayahuasca has an agenda within your system. It's taking you for a ride. Mushrooms, that, that is your, uh, that is, you know, this mycelial agenda that's um, taking you for a ride. The thing about breath work is that there is no other agenda besides your own respiration. And if we break down the etymology of respiration is to respire or to respirit. A lot of these Eastern uh, cultures look at your breath as your life force energy. And so every time you respire, you respirit. You breathe your soul back into your body so you can become embodied in that, from that place and operate from that place. And our respiration is so intrinsically connected to our inspiration. To become inspired is to take in the spirit. So many people want to go up and out of the body where it's like um, we actually need to become inspired or respired um, so that we can show up from that place right here, right now in connection to each other. Yeah, you just, you said it, you said a few things that I've, I find as a common theme as I interview people more and more. Um, you know, even last week I was just saying, and I've said this before, that our society has this, um, what I call the Amazon Prime effect. You know, they just want everything yeah. now, like delivered to our door and without any of the work. And, you know, with the growth of the psychedelic field and the decriminalization, legalization, it, there is kind of this new sense of like, well, now I'll just go do a bunch of psychedelics and see if that fixes things. Or, yeah. you no, know, I heard microdosing will cure my depression. Like, let me, you know, and it's still kind of the same issue. And um, actually, my former partner is a, a core energetics therapist, which I'm sure you know a lot about. It's very similar work around the energy system and the patterning and um, and it is true. A lot of people who are drawn to psychedelics are actually just still looking to go up and in, in, you know, they're in the head and they just want to go further away. And it's just a new way of dissociating from what's really at hand here, which is actually the opposite, which is like, maybe the world's problems would be solved if we were all embodied, you know, if we weren't in a yeah. constant fear state on a, a collective level. Um, and there is no denying that, it is kind of a feels like an unsafe world, but when you're in your body and grounded and really have the regulation of your nervous system, it doesn't feel doesn't feel that unsafe anymore. It's like my I've worked so much on this on myself where it's like I don't even feel one ounce of that trigger anymore. It's just like, oh, OK, yeah. here it is. And that's where we have the space and the energy level to then hopefully create some kind of change um, and within yeah, our lives and in the collective. Huh? Sorry, yeah. I didn't mean to cut you off, yeah. but um, dissociation is something that I'm so uh, interested in and passionate about. Um, I think dissociation is actually the number one sort of issue um, in our world or in our collective. And we're kind of trained to dissociate, especially with technology. 
Um, there's sort of a, a, a trauma of technology that's going on, which I want people to understand that trauma actually creates growth. So we actually have an op- I'm, a, I'm an opportunist um, and we actually have an opportunity to grow from this as a whole, um, as a collective. But the trauma or the stressor of technology is that our nervous systems are ancient. They, uh, we have evolved, um, evolutionary biology, uh, has been cultivated for thousands of years. Our nervous systems have evolved. Um, and we operate in a very specific way that is quite ancient. And now we have all of this technology where our nervous systems are designed to deal with our immediate reality and what's in front of us. We're not designed to look at our phone screen or our TV and to see um, terrible things that are going on on the other side of the world. And so your body on a cellular level, on a biological level, it knows and it understands, the intelligence of your body understands that you are intrinsically connected to every human and every other living thing on this planet. And so when you see something traumatic that's going on on the other side of the world, there is this sort of felt sense in your body that you want to help other people. Humans, we're, we're, we're mammals. We're designed to help other humans. And that's like a default setting inside of us um, until it's kind of trained out. But we see what's going on on the other side of the world. And is there anything that we can do in that present moment And a lot of the times there is not anything that we can do in the present moment. And so we're taking on the weight of the world and our nervous systems are designed to deal with our immediate reality. And so there is sort of this trained dissociation. It's like, well, there's nothing I can do about it right now. And they're on the other side of the world. So I guess there's not a lot I can do. It's not happening in my immediate reality, but what's, um, What's very interesting about this is that your body knows that if someone dumps toxins in a river, you know, on the other side of the world, that eventually that water is going to make up the water in your children's children. And so there is no disconnect. Um, And there is a dissociation on a collective level, like knowing that what's happening on the other side of the world, um, it's not affecting me right now, so I don't have to care about it. Um, There's also a dissociation between our mind and our body. And that I think is my biggest mission here is to help people connect their minds back to their bodies and to become body centered beings first, because we are body centered beings first. We are mind centered beings second. Our frontal lobe has just developed recently in our, in our evolution. And so when you start to help people connect to the intelligence of their body, um, it makes them want to connect to the intelligence of the planet, to connect to um, the natural processes of uh, the soil. Um, and the, when you want to take care of your body, you want to take care of each other. You want to take care of the planet. And like, if your mind was responsible for some of the autonomic functions that go on in your body, we'd all be fucked. Like if your if your mind was responsible for cellular repair, like you can't even fathom what goes on in set. Like you're repairing on a cellular level every day. You're digesting your food. Like what's the actual energy that's beating your heart? Like, are you beating your heart? Like there's so much intelligence in this vessel in nature itself that our minds can't even like come close to fathoming. So we want to try to understand things on a mind-centered level instead of just uh, attuned to the innate intelligence that's, that's, uh, that is biology in itself. And so when you start to help people reconnect to that, um, it, it really um, puts them in a place where dissociation is, is no longer needed. And that starts to ripple out when it starts with you know the connection of mind and body. And then it starts the connection of relating to other people. And I think relationships and relating connection is one of our greatest purposes on this planet. And you can only connect to someone else as deep as you've connected to yourself. Like I see this with my mom or other people that um, they don't want to go inside because it's dark in there. 
And the longer you've been on this planet, probably, and and the and the longer you've kind of uh, pushed things down, the harder it becomes. And I see this with a lot of people that they don't want to go inside, and they also don't want to connect to people around them because it's scary, and they have a hard time connecting with other people because they don't they they can't connect to self, and we become enmeshed. We lose what is self and what is other. There's like a, a loss of boundary. Um, and so to be able to relate with other humans, we have to be able to relate to ourself. And we are communal beings. We are designed to live in community. We are designed to communicate with each other. And there's so much um, miscommunications that happen as well. So you can kind of see where I'm going here as far as my mission. <laughs> I love your mission. Sign me up. I'm on board because this is the exact thing. I, I mean, I talk about this so much where it's like we're seeing in our world, you know, what seems to be like this chaos and, you know, some people are connected, some are disconnected. But generally, the one thing I've heard the most um, besides the chaos and intensity of the changing times that we're in is this feeling of disconnection, you know, like no community. Where do I belong? I don't belong here. I don't feel safe here. But really, you know, it's that connection to self first. And I think that's where we're seeing this played out. Like, let's say on the internet where there's people pointing the fingers at one another, people externally, you know, projecting everything outward, 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 instead of actually doing, taking the time and the energy to go inward, which feels so damn scary. I mean, it really is. And I, I, yeah, it's like scary and not like for me, it's, no, no problem anymore, but I get it. It's like my mom no total dissociation, you know, from, um, you know, avoiding lots of issues her whole entire life. And I could go on and on. It's not just my mom. It's, you know, like four other people in my family, but, but let's talk, I want to talk about something you mentioned, because this has come up a lot, um, especially the last few years as more people out there on the internet, let's say on Instagram, for instance, are learning about trauma, but they're learning about trauma through something like Instagram, which yeah. not saying there's anything wrong with that, but there's a lot more to the story. And I love your take on trauma is here for growth, right? It's like, there, it's not all bad. And the reality is all humans have trauma of some sort, some level. But I have heard some people go into this, this state of, well, I have trauma. <laughs> it's kind of this, you yeah. know, what I would call like a victimized state of, well, I have so much trauma that I'm not going to do that, or I'm not going to go there, or, you know, like it's beyond boundaries. It's almost like kind of a, a crutch. I mean, do you find that our society is kind of like, like becoming going in this direction? And where do we find that balance between actually handling trauma like that is truly real versus saying like, oh, well, but I have so much trauma that I just, I can't go to that meeting today. I mean, I've literally heard yeah. people say things like this. And where wow. is this balance point to getting this right around handling the trauma, healing the trauma, and actually living a full life, even if you have had trauma, which most likely you have if you are a human? What is your take on that? <laughs> yeah, it's a great, it's Controversial. a great question. First, we kind of have first we kind of have to define the word um, because a lot of the words are the carrier of meaning, right? And we can kind of assume that we're talking about the same thing because someone could be using the word trauma, and it could have a completely different different definition. Um, and I, I really love Gaber Mate's uh, definition, and it's it's trauma is not the actual thing that's happening to you. It's what's happening inside of you based on that thing that's happening to you. And it is subjective, meaning that what's traumatic to you might not be traumatic to me. And so we don't know what is traumatic to anyone. Like, um, you know, I, you could have a lollipop taken from you when you were three years old and that could be very traumatic. And maybe that creates a defense system where you feel like people are out to get you and take your things. And maybe it, like it stems into this whole sc scarcity complex. And there's, and we, we actually don't know what's tr traumatic. Um, so it's, it's really subjective. So first off, I don't really even, um, go into someone's trauma necessarily. Uh, I don't really need to like break apart the story. Um, I'm not so focused on the story. Um, I'm focused on the soma or the body. 
And so, and this, it's so interesting because so many people want to work specifically with the trauma. And when you're doing that, you're co-funding the trauma. Like you're putting more energy to the trauma. Um, when really it's, it's, it's more about like, where's like, I always see the growth. I always see like, we have to, I always come from the place of honoring the innate intelligence. Like I always come from the place of like, wow, this human is so incredible that it found the best possible way that it could deal and cope with whatever it's moving through. And these trauma, it's, it's not necessarily trauma. It's a trauma response. It's not stress. It's a stress response. And so it's what's happening inside of you based on that thing. And to be honest with you, we become very fragile. We become very fragile um, as a culture, as a society. And so I'm not necessarily on the side of, um, of funding that sort of fragility. I'm more on the side of helping someone build resilience um, because we have to become more resilient. Uh, it's like nowadays we're not necessarily having to fight for food and shelter and all of these things. Um, we have a pretty cush, most of us, not all of us have a fairly cush life. Um, but trauma is not the thing that's happening to us. It's what's happening inside of us. And at first it's an intelligent response. Like whatever that trauma response was, whether it was fighting the thing, flighting it, or maybe freeze and numbing or fawning, whatever it was, it was an intelligent response that kept you safe in the moment. So first off, I just want to honor that. Wow. How incredible, how incredibly intelligent your, your being is. Um, secondly, um, we have to understand like what our processes are on a body centered level, because I said we are body centered beings first. We have to understand those processes and honor those processes. We don't honor those processes in our, in our culture. We try to work with people from a top down model from working with someone's mind and working with someone's story. And it's sort of like this back and forth, um, like a uh, rewriting of the story. But you can work with someone's story all day long. If they're stuck in a contracted state, in a wounded state, like if an animal is in a wounded state, it's going to lash out at you, even if you're trying to help them. And so I work with the body specifically, the soma, and that encompasses someone's instincts and someone's emotions um, a lot of the time. So when something traumatic happens to us, say someone broke into your house, you're not operating off your mind. You're operating off of instincts first. And our instincts are memories, patterns that we've inherited. We've inherited through years and years of development and all through ancestral trauma or ancestral growth, whatever you want to call it. Um, We operate off that first. So if someone breaks into your house, you have an instinctual response. And that instinctual response is to keep you alive. And maybe that's running, maybe that's fighting, maybe that's just like, freezing. Um, that doesn't happen in your mind. Secondly, you're going to feel an emotion and that emotion is such a powerful chemical, uh, uh, concoction of glandular secretions, um, through your system. And maybe that emotion is fear. Maybe that emotion is courage. Like I'm going to fuck this person up. (laughs) Um, that still doesn't happen in your mind. Only lastly, does our mind start to kick in and create a story So only after that whole thing happened, do you start to cement the story and the perception and the perception and the story is based off of what your organism chose, um, on an emotional and an instinctual level. And so maybe if you chose to fight this person and, and you've fended them off, maybe the story that runs in the background now is that I'm, I'm courageous. Like I can handle myself. Maybe if you like uh, ran or you're scared or, um, I mean, there's so many different things, but maybe that's the, the story and the perception that cements is that I'm, uh, I'm, uh, the world's out to get me or the world is not a safe place. Um, and so that becomes the, the lens that now we're operating from, but that lens a lot of the times is based off of what happened on an emotional and an instinctual level. And so that defense system that, that, that comes up in the moment is intelligent, but 
animals and biological beings, they have a way of releasing those defense systems because those defense systems are intelligent in the moment. And we've sort of lost touch to the natural processes that allow us to release defense systems. And that happens on a somatic level. And if you've studied Body Keeps the Score or you know, Waking the Tiger or any of these um, sort of like foundational somatic uh, 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 books, knowledge, that the movement of energy or the discharge within your system is the signal to your system that you're not in the presence of a stressor anymore. So the movement of that energy, and you can look at children perhaps, like when something happens to a child, um, they immediately start throwing a temper tantrum or they immediately start crying. And that's their system moving that energy through their system. Instead, if we don't have a opportunity or a way to move that energy through our system, it becomes suppressed or re repressed or maybe even depressed until it starts to densify into a sort of dis-ease of energy moving through your system. And so the natural way for us to move that energy through our system is expression, is discharging. Um, and some of the most stressed out people have, and some of the most traumatized people have found ways to move that stress or that trauma into a form of expression. I guarantee if you were to look at, you know, some of your favorite music, some of your favorite artists, um, there were probably very stressed out people that found a way to channel that into a form of expression. And so humans are expression vessels. Um, we can express in so many cool physical ways. We create you know, we create businesses or things that help other people. And so part of that is finding the route of like somatic expression that this being wants to do because there is a signal to your nervous system that once it's expressed, once it's moved through you, you're not in the presence of a stressor anymore. So there's so many people that are walking around where they've done these mental gymnastics of working with their story, um, but their body is still uh, thinking that they're in the presence of a tiger. Mm. Um, so uh, so working with um, whatever needs to come up. And, you know, I, I, I see this so much of like, you know, people are like, well, let's just express like free freedom of expression and all of these things. And it's, it's more about finding healthy ways of expression um, having containers for expression because, you know, fortunately and probably unfortunately, we can't just go into a grocery store and start yelling and screaming <laughs> and all of that, that sort of thing. Like we have to create spaces. Mm -hmm. We have to create containers for people to be able to express in a healthy way where they are seen, heard, and felt by an empathetic witness, by someone who's non-judgmental, by someone who honors the innate intelligence of someone else's bo body of someone's body and mind. I think the, uh, the field of, um, self-development, um, or self-improvement is actually a facade. Um, there is no such thing as self-development because we actually need each other. Um, we are communal beings and we need each other. And one of my favorite quotes from Bessel van der Kolk is healing happens in the presence of an empathetic witness. So, there's lots more there, but I, I was rambling a little bit. <clears throat> no, it's amazing. And also Jesus said this, when two or more are gathered, um, because yes, the healing in relation yeah, is yeah. so much more powerful. And I'm so glad you're doing this work because this is, uh, like you said, resiliency, I believe I, I completely agree. This is what we need for these times. I personally, um, you know, I, I don't buy into the excuse of, well, I have so much trauma that I'm just not going to do anything, or I have so much trauma that I'm going to not live fully. Um, and, and you shed a lot of light on this and seeing it in this whole other perspective as, you know, opportunity is growth as a potential for, um, you know, how do you want to feel better? What do you want to do in the world? And it is a different time than actually being chased by tigers. So thank you so much for I'll, these perspectives. I'll say one yeah. more thing on that. And that is, um, like we are communal beings, we are tribal beings, and we all want to feel like we're bringing something to the table for our community, mm -hmm. for our tribe. And the thing that we can bring to the table for our community, for our tribe is a lot of the times the shit that we've gone through and the stuff that we've overcome. Mm -hmm. 
And so we put so much um, emphasis and so much um, value on like reading books and studying and all of the mental things that we've done. Um, but we don't put value in, on our own experiences. Like you have a PhD in all of the experiences that you've, you've gone through. And so I talked to so many people in business, um, you know, self-worth, self-value, those are the number one issues that stifle people. And if we start to reframe that to like actually honoring yourself and all of the experiences that you've gone through and all of the things that you've overcome, um, you actually have been through a lot and you have a lot of skills and a lot of things um, that you can actually bring to the table. And most of the time people find um, purpose in the service of other people. Um, we find our purpose in the service of others. And a lot of the times that service is uh, based on the shit that we've gone through and the mm -hmm. stuff that we've overcome. Yes. This is all my clients. This is what I practice and preach all day, every day. This is it. And this is how we create a larger transformation on the planet. So speaking of service, my last question for you before we go is, what do you say to people who want to, let's say, take your training and then, or, or any breathwork training, really, because there are a lot of others lot out of there. They're all quite different. But what about people who want to make breathwork their business? Is this a business? Does it have potential? Where do you think the future is going when it comes to breath work in our world? Well, I think that um, first off, there is not a shortage of people that are looking for this work. And I think that if you were to ask me like five, 10 years ago, like if I would have been doing this, I, I don't think so. <laughs> I was so hard on myself for so long as far as finding my purpose and finding my, like, what's my unique expression in the world. And, um, I had to have a specific vision. Um, but until I like aligned myself to what the world is actually asking for, um, uh, it was very hard and very taxing. Um, but now I feel this sort of global momentum, um, that really has my back and gives me, um, plenty of energy to operate from. And I did an interview um, with a, 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 a Shipibo shaman um, recently, and I asked him, did ayahuasca, ha has ayahuasca given people messages um, that are different, like before COVID or, or, or after COVID? Um, and he was like, wow, that's a really good question. And he told me that in the year 2020, um, uh, him and his shaman friends, they, uh, witness sort of this dark cloud descend upon the world. Um, and at that time there was, you know, these Australian fires that were going on, um, these fires all over California, all over the world, the lungs of our planet are, are burning. And then very, uh, uh, soon after that, we have this sort of respiratory virus, um, that is a global epidemic, um, or a global, um, I don't even know what the word I'm spacing, um, but this sort of <laughs> yeah. pandemic, sorry, <laughs> global pandemic, that's um, literally putting people on respirators and attacking people's ability to breathe. And then shortly after that, we had this whole racial thing that came up where a man was being choked, yelling, what? I can't breathe. And so, and then after that, we were forced to wear masks. And um, I, I, I truly feel that there is this sort of global uh, restriction on our ability to respire, to respirit. Um, and so the signs in the world, um, and I literally have had thousands and thousands of messages from people all over the world that uh, perhaps see some, some content of people releasing or feeling emotions. And a lot of them don't really understand what's going on, but it makes them feel something. And it's way beyond me saying anything because they can't, uh, they can't understand my language. Um, but emotions are a global language and they might not understand it fully. Uh, but it's making them feel something and they want to feel the world wants to feel because to feel is to become more alive. And so there is a, a global need for this work right now. Um, and there is no shortage. Um, and it's like I said in the beginning, 
Um, if you are someone that is working with uh, humans in any sort of capacity, um, whether you know it or not, you are a breath worker because your breath is the only body rhythm that you do both consciously and unconsciously. It is the bridge between your conscious mind and body and your unconscious mind and body. It is the toggle switch or the button that you have inside of yourself to actually control your state, to control your nervous system state. Um, so it helps people regain nervous system sovereignty um, and to become response able. I think that a lot of the answers to this uh, issues that we've kind of been covering is actually to become responsible. Like it's not sexy, um, but spirituality is actually responsibility. And we break down that word uh, to have the ability to respond and not react. And so to become actually conscious, um, to make conscious decisions, um, you have to be responsible and you have to um, be able to take things in and then respond in the corresponding way. So a lot of people come that already have a, a business or they're already working with people in some sort of capacity. And this is just another tool to really, really um, work with people on a mind and body level. I think there's a new paradigm kind of going on in the uh, coaching sphere where if you are just working with someone on a mind-centered level or you are just working with someone on a body-centered level, you're going to get left behind because um, you can't separate them. You cannot dissociate them anymore. They're intrinsically connected. And until you figure that out, you're, whatever you're doing is probably not working. Yes. It's, it's funny because I'm a business coach. I help people start and grow their businesses. And I'm like, even I bring in somatic therapy modalities into my coaching because it isn't just about learning marketing and that's it. It has to be an embodied business, especially when your business is you. And that when you are finally, you know, to that place where you're embodied and you're truly aligned and living that heart centered purpose, it's like everything just becomes easy. Like you said, it's yeah. like it becomes a response to, you know, what's pulling you or what the world wants or what's coming into your field and versus the old paradigm of like push, 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 which to me is, you know, it's not sustainable and it's dying out anyway. So Stephen, this was so inf informative. We're going to have to bring you back on to talk about more. Um, just take a minute to talk about what you have coming up in the next few months and where we have your links right here in the show notes. But yeah, what, what's coming up that people can find out about? Yeah. Thank you so much, Beth. It was, it was a really refreshing conversation. So I really enjoyed it. Um, I just moved to Austin. So I'm getting here, I'm getting grounded. Uh, we have an upcoming training, um, here, a, uh, somatic breathwork, uh, training, uh, July 7th through the 10th. That's a four day intensive. Um, and it is an intensive, <laughs> uh, here in Austin, uh, we also have some coming up in in San Diego, and also uh, there will be a lot of a lot of things going on here in Austin. It's kind of our new hub. Um, we have an online training that's running right now. We'll do another online uh, twelve week program in September. Um, but right now, I am just sort of relaxing and integrating and um, becoming grounded here. And uh, we have so so much planned. I will be. Uh, starting to go back into my podcast as well, the Mind Body Mentor podcast. So there's a ton of episodes on there, um, but I've been a little bit um, I've been a little bit out of the podcast game for a little while. But we're going to be uh, re reemerging very soon, so you can check us out there. Um, you can connect with us on Instagram. Um, our Instagram is uh, at Somatic Release, or my personal Instagram is at Jaggers J R, um, and yeah somaticbreathwork.com. Beautiful. Thank you so much for being here. This was amazing. And yeah, we'll have your links right here in the show notes. Check out his work. Maybe Stephen, I'll come to one of these uh, intensive trainings in Austin. Maybe I'll be living in Austin this fall. We'll see. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. No, it's such good peoples and it's kind of, it's been pulling me along with everybody else, but it seems to be the amazing place for a great community. So. Thank you so much for being here and everybody will have another episode on Tuesday next week. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you, Beth. I hope you enjoyed the episode. If you're feeling inspired, I'd appreciate it if you showed your love with a review. 
And check out my YouTube channel where you can find the video version of this podcast. You can also head to BethAWeinstein.com to learn more about me and grab my free business growth trainings. Remember, you carry your own unique medicine and your medicine is what we need for these times.